400 <laughs> miles per spin hour, the tires. the tires are still spinning. What we do is when it got to the point of entering the last mile, we basically turned the traction control upside down where it got dumb, didn't do anything, mm -hmm. because we needed that seven or eight or nine seconds wow. at full power, not at 10 or 12 degrees. Right. So if you look at the average power, it probably the average power is a stretch, I think, is 2,000. For the whole run. Hey, welcome to Car Guy Confessions, brought to you by ARP. I'm Jeff Smith. This is my car buddy Cam Benty and car builder Steve Strope, and we're going to tell you some stories. Hey, welcome to another episode of Car Guy Confessions with Jeff Smith. We're at an undisclosed location again. They actually blindfolded me, brought me out to someplace in Camarillo. Steve, where are we? We are in beautiful Camarillo, California. You eagle-eyed guys out there uh, might notice uh, new gear hanging here. Now, this is from a company called Road. Our ODE, and I was very fortunate. We built a really cool little 1962 right hand drive Toyota Stout pickup, kept the stock four and the four on the tree uh, for uh, the gentleman who owns Road Microphone. Yes, four, four, on, the tree. On, the tree. four on the tree. Four on the tree. Uh, Peter guy, Friedman a, owns Road Microphone. Got big biceps. <laughs> and a fantastic, fun little truck. And you can go on our website and look at There's actually a, a fun little video on, on the, uh, about the truck, too, mm -hmm. driving it around. And it's so much fun, right hand drive and shifting four speed up here. It's a, it's a ball. Wow. So Road was kind enough to bless us with this gear. And I've done, those of you who know anything a little bit about me besides the car building, I've done a bunch of filming. And I can tell you this stuff is phenomenal, but it's obtainable and you can get professional quality results out of it. He's got little mixing boards and obviously mics and mic stands. So I highly recommend, even though this sounds like one big advertisement, it kind of is. This stuff is fantastic, and we are blessed to use it, and thank you to Rode for it. But you guys should really go check it out. So it's Rode Microphones, and uh, you yeah. can go check. You know what? I am unprepared, by the way, guys. I'm not sure I should really know since I built the car for him the <laughs> web address for it. And I'm waiting for one of my off-camera guys yeah. to be flipping up a screen to give me the cheat. He's That's looking it. for it now. So I'll just make up stuff while That's I'm right. talking right This is now. good stuff. I mean, I <laughs> So one of the things I like to do is always assemble an engine with ARP bolts, and it's not just because they're sponsors, but because it really does work. Um, and and the stuff is fantastic. I never have to worry about it. Steve, you build building cars too. Yeah, uh, actually, it's part of my baseline design plan when I'm building a car that's going to be shown or featured in a magazine. It's part of the plan right. to have that little bit of diamonds all over the engine bay or in the suspension. Yeah. Yeah, the stuff is beautiful. I remember um, a long time ago, I built the uh, first time I ever touched it, 69Z28. All of the uh, water jacket holes had stripped out, yeah. and I learned about ARP studs. So check them out at arp-bolts.com or check out their catalog. You'll find everything you're looking for. We have a special guest today, Kenny Duttweiler, a good friend of mine we've known for a long, long time, and talk horsepower and in depth. And of course, Cam Benty, my good friend Cam Benty. Yeah. So we're gonna jump jump right into this because there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. This is the master of horsepower. I I, I assemble engines. Kenny's an engine builder, right? So yeah. so uh, yeah, make but, sure you take uh, notes because it's gonna be a it's gonna be a bumpy ride of spots <laughs> for some of you guys that, that don't know what torque means. But anyway, uh, just try to it's gonna be lots stick of, with us. Lots yeah. of talk about torque horsepower yeah no, i think it's, so, the, it's so, the seat that makes me silly yeah it's because i was here when yeah, stroke was that's there. right but i am in, growing my hair the, out so we're good you're we'll in be, the steve we'll be a step up you're in the that, steve so. seat today you bet so so the connection to our thing here with is is arp because obviously they use uh, you know, a lot of arp fasteners in in the speed demon and you saw something that you thought was interesting yes there's a lot of stuff that goes on here that actually relates right back to arp but you know we've known kenny i mean 30, 40 years, right? He's I mean, we've been seeing guy. him. 30, I mean, years, yeah. I mean, we all kind of got to know Kenny best initially, at least for me. I should talk for myself. Uh, Grand National days, because you were like the king of the Grand National uh, modification guy. You took the V6s and made them unbelievably <laughs> strong. I mean, I've got, <laughs> I've gone through here and I'm pulling out stuff and and we're finding you know 2,000 2000 horsepower V6 uh, turbo uh, Buicks and it's just. That's the magic of Kenny Duttweiler. He, he was able to take those things. And, and, I, and I know that you build a lot of other stuff, and we're going to talk about that. But that was when I got to know you and know that you were the guy. And pull up to the parking lot and find, like, nothing but Buicks. It's and, like and pretty the crazy. Is, the thing is with building engines, too, it's like, you know, in our business, we can cheat things all the time. We cheat them all the time to get the stuff we need. When you're an engine builder, you can't do that. It has to be right. 
right? And if it's it has NA, to be right. And if it's NA, it's really hard. Yes, <laughs> if it's NA, it's really hard. So you saw something here that you yeah, thought was interesting, I did, right? which is relating to uh, ARP, obviously, and it was pretty interesting because clearly, you know, the fact that ARP builds a lot of really high-quality uh, bolts and nuts and fasteners are just, it's that's kind of a known thing, but a lot of people don't know that they'll actually build custom stuff for you for custom applications because folks like Kenny, they're not just, you know, pulling bolts out, you know, they're pulling a kit together on they bought off a of summit, which great company, but not what we're doing here. But the bottom line is we're talking about he's got a, a special application, and, and this is a quote from a story that I saw. He wrote, he, he said, and correct me if I'm uh, in, interpreting uh, and anything you want to add to it, but uh, you have the ability to order an undercut on the shank or the head stud. It gives you the ability to stretch the fastener without killing the block. For example, a half-inch stud may take 140 pounds of torque, but the block won't hold 140 pounds. If you undercut the stud and lower the torque, you can still get the stretch and clamp load. And that's all, you know, that's someone who really understands bolt loads, clamping forces, all those other things. But you have to have that kind of knowledge and understand what you're looking for when you buy fasteners because you're in uncharted territory. You're, you're a cutting edge. True, and what prefaced that article or that statement was, I built uh, an LS for Bonneville. I went to a PRI show, and Maskins had the, the, the dart nicks with the 10-degree head and all that mm -hmm. stuff, so I bought a whole bunch of stuff on the spot. So half-inch head studs. Obviously, I figured I'd, I, I was mixed emotion, but I thought, well, I'll do the half-inch head stud. So we did the half-inch head stud. We go to Bonneville, make a pass. thing ran decently good. We went to impound, pulled spark plugs out. Water's run out of the spark plug hole. Oh, so not good. that's not good. No. So we... Chris and I changed the head in the impound, and, and then after we calmed down, went back and looked at the data, we had 50 pounds of pressure in the cooling system from about the third mile on. So That's a lot. That's a ton. So the next run, it was down to about 20, mm -hmm. but it's still high. Yeah. So we got back, and I, I gave the studs to Chris. I says, please undercut these to 7 16 and he did. And we, the last Rasky time we had any Chris pressure Rasky game. At, uh, yeah. and yeah. what it, yeah. what it yeah. amounts to is whether it's a bolt or a stud, anything, it, there's a, a certain amount of clamp load that gives a certain amount of yield, but not enough yield to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And you want it to do that so that it, it, so it has memory that can compress, uh, it can lift, it can try to lift, but it can also go back. When you have a half inch head stud at 115 or 20 pounds, all it does is lift. Right. And, and you can tell because Essentially, you can torque it, and then when you break it loose, it's about a half a turn of the nut, and then there's, there's nothing there. Right. And that's, that's when it's wrong. That's when the reference to a bolt is like a spring. Yeah, and during the course of a little earlier on that deal, uh, I was going to work with some uh, these custom-made 325 studs on all the Bonneville engines. Mm -hmm. So they gave me the studs, so I said, well, what do I torque them to? And I said, I don't know. I said, they gave me this device that you could put clamp load on it. You, you, you torque it, and it, and it would and measure the clamp load, right? Me measure the clamp load. Right. So we were shooting for 28,000 pounds, and that ended up on a 716 stud being about 115 pounds of torque. But what got really interesting, and this is something that will drive people crazy. So somebody mentioned, said, well, you know, that's with a new nut. I said, okay, what are you trying to tell me? Well, try a used nut. Yeah. Well, I had a bunch of them there on the, on the cylinder home that I used for torque plate heads. They've been off a million so, times. Yeah, so uh, the same torque with the well-worn nut, I got 13,000 pounds, not 19,000 pounds. Wow. So wow. immediately you throw those away, and if you tell somebody about it and they believe you, it just drives them crazy because now they got to go buy a whole bunch of brand-new nuts and use them 10 times and throw them away. <laughs> but these are the things that somebody says, well, yeah, I torched it to 80 pounds. But unless you can measure the stretch, like on a rod bolt, you know, a rod bolt, you just stretch them five thousandths or whatever it is. That's what you're going to do. Right, right. But you don't stretch a stud. Yeah. So we'd like to thank our sponsor, Automotive Touch-Up. Um, I've actually used this stuff on many occasions. We, we built a little 64 El Camino. We actually painted the interior, the dash on it, a steel dash. It worked out really well. It's a two-part deal, and it works very well both as touch-up and or as a small parts that you want to paint himself. And yeah. I can attest to... If you follow directions and do it right, I had my first two, three magazine feature cars, one of which was a top 10 car and a cover car. Tons of parts were done with rattle can because I didn't have the money or the connections to have it fancy painted with a real paint gun. So I've used 
rattle can paint to build full feature cars. So get to work. Yeah, and I use it for rock chips when you're driving cars. Obviously, they get stone chips and such, and those are they make a perfect match. I mean, what you do is you go online, you put in your information about your car, and they will match exactly your paint code, which is very cool. So you're not kind of guessing. You are getting exactly guessing. what you code. asked for. Yeah. Right. right. So check them out at AutomotiveTouchUp.com. The Formula One guys, when they order those little minuscule bolts that hold something together, uh-huh. You know, they have to be certified and all this kind of stuff. I remember an occasion where they got uh, about, I think it was about $30,000 worth of bolts in a little box, and somebody found a fingerprint on one of them. Ooh. Game over. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing. Because when they get up into that level, like the, yeah. it's the custom age Yeah, so just, custom just age stuff. the moisture from your finger could ruin Will the corrode the bolt, right. Yeah. I, I had uh, Kazi tell me one time that he had put together some rods on – compressed them to check rod clearance or something, set it on the shelf for a while, came back, and the bolt had actually broken for that same reason. It had really? got some fingerprint on it, Just and it corroded it, and it popped it, right? Yeah. He's, it was like, Well, we're talking such boy. precision here. We're not talking about stuff that people are, you know, it's not a hobby deal. This is a very cutting edge, as I mentioned before. This is stuff that that um, the high-end builders have to deal with, and, and that's why things cost what they cost. The thing that enables us to get to the point we're at. You know, yes. we, we thought we were... Doing pretty good. We made six or seven hundred horsepower with right. with those Buick V6s. I mean, that was <laughs> earth shattering. Right. But as manufacturing support came along you know, from every area, you know, right. from the metal parts, the electronics, and all that. Sure. You know, you triple that number. Yeah, yeah. So which leads us right to it. I mean, it's perfect, <laughs> perfect segue to because now it's like horsepower is easy to make. I mean, probably at the levels that you're working on, it's not easy, but, but it's easier than it used to be for an average guy like me to just bolt some parts together and now make eight or 900 horsepower. But we're talking about some motors that make some really serious power. So, so serious. Sirius serious. is serious over 3,000 horsepower yes. in the yes. 556. Was that? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was, that's, that's not the, leaning on it. And that's not leaning on oh, it at well, 31. That, you hear that term all the time. Yeah, we didn't lean on it. The bottom line is. Uh, we were 35 pounds of boost, 3,200 horsepower. So we're looking at the shaft speed on the turbos. It's 74,000 RPMs. So I was talking to the guys at Precision. I said, so what, what is the shaft speed? He says, well, a lot of the drag race guys go to 120,000. So we literally had a fair amount of, uh, yeah, that's of quite air supply way. left. Yeah. 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 Right. And probably, realistically, if you look at what the turbos are capable of and what the cylinder heads flow and stuff, it's probably a 3,600 horsepower deal. Thirty six hundred horsepower, yeah, but and this over five miles. Well, no, now you're not at thirty six hundred the whole time. No, we're, we're feeding power. Up we're to feeding it. power to it. It's, it's right. wide open throttle for five miles. Right, yes. right. And power is kind of like it's like a real it's like a one minute dyno pull, and you just kind of ramp the power in, <laughs> and you find a place on the course where the tire spin is gone. Right. Yeah. And then you cut it loose, basically. Yeah. So that's about so, eight so or ten you, seconds. If you test that engine on your dyno, how long do you run it at wide open throttle at that at a, at a given power level? Not very long. So you're not going to actually test it the way, but just because of the heat? Well, there's a difference between something's in a car that has the ability to accelerate at any rate it wants. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, it's a couple thousand RPMs. A second on some of the stuff, you know, drag race stuff, you know, when, Fast, you, yeah. when you leave the starting line, you go from 4,500 to, to 10,000 10, right. in about a second and a half. Yeah. Well, the dynamometer being a dynamometer, right. it's Can't do that. been told that it can yeah. accelerate the engine at five or 600 RPMs a second, mm-hmm. Right. period. So that means that the engine is doing about 10 times as much work. work. Okay. So, okay. you know, you can do a 10 second dyno pull is probably worse than a one minute Bonneville pull. Really? Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because because, because it, on on the track, it's, it's oh, being, you're spinning the tires, limited, you're, you're spinning the tires. The torque converter's got some slippage right, in it. Right. There's something something giving up between the two. Right. But when that clamp out there says, "I'm just going to hold you at that level," <laughs> you know, and it's working and it, real and it hard. Detonates a little bit. Yeah. It'll go a head gasket. Yeah. I mean, you can shoot yeah. a head gasket on a dyno. Uh, when you would never have it fail in the car. And, and just to step back for that second, when you said the, this, the water pressure came up, that's because the gaskets were leaking and putting well, cylinder it, pressure it, into it the... It lifted the head, and those LS blocks have got a million goddamn holes in the top of the block. Mm-hmm. 
opportunity for pressure to in, get into go the cooling into system. The cooling system. Yes. Right. And uh, so when you see the cooling system pressure rise, you know you're, you're starting. Oh, to Oh, absolutely. Leak. I mean, after that, that become our tuning tool. Yeah. You, you watch it. Okay. So you just watch the. the yeah. If we, the, if we start at ten pressure. pounds of pressure, we expect to see it fifteen. If we start mm -hmm. at no pressure, we expect to see it at five. Okay. And that's just the heat of expansion of the water. Uh -huh. And since it's not a radiator, it's a tank. Right. So, right. It's, uh, but it, uh, it's pretty good information. But I, I know you and I talked a number of years ago about the early concept with, with the Streamliner, which was to run a small displacement motor and spin it very, very hard, as opposed to a big displacement motor and spin it slower, or not, not quite as hard. But, but then SCTA said you can't have the record in AA with... with a with a small inch motor because <laughs> yeah. it, it had to be over 501 yeah. cubic inches. Exactly. So, and so even though you'd already beat the record for double A blown fuel streamliner right. for, for the record, you, they wouldn't give it to you because the displacement was too small. Exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's, so, it's still at is that still where you are? It's 556 or 7 somewhere. Okay. Maybe. I, right. I, I get it wrong every time somebody asks me. Yeah. Marlon Davis. <laughs> Well, if Marlon Davis says it's 557, it is 557. Because <laughs> Marlon Mar is very meticulous. Yeah, phone calls. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have had uh, a long relationship with uh, Marlon long Davis. From All Hot three Rock of us have a yes. long relationship yeah. with Marlon. And varied so. at this point. And, yes. and Marlon, we love you to death. Yes. We love you to death, Absolutely. buddy. So, so you have, the Streamliner has the record right now in, in A, B, C, D, and F. And F was with the four-cylinder. Four-cylinder Dodge. Was, that was yeah. the Dodge motor. Yeah. And then D would be under 300 cubic inches, 299? Yeah, no, under 302. 302. 306, whatever it is, yeah. Okay. Five liter. Five liter, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that was, that, was, that was the little motor, so that was the 299 motor? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but it's not the little one now. The little one's 257. 257. So what, born stroke on that is what? So you're going to get a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> 2380 on the stroke. 2380. Wow. 4135 on the bore. So wow, big bore, small 4, stroke. 4135, well, that's almost 4 typical. Well, it's the same block we ran the 388 with. Just destroked it. Just yeah. took about an inch and a half stroke out of it. Uh -huh. Same inch cylinder heads, half. same everything. Yeah. Inch and a half is a lot. Yes. yes. That is a lot. Had, I had, actually had to make a concession and put a smaller camshaft in it. Uh -huh. But uh, Why the, so? Uh, what, what, why did you have to go with a smaller camshaft? Pressures? Just, just no engine displacement. Yeah. Oh, just displacement. Yeah. As the motor gets smaller, yeah. the yeah. camshaft okay. has yeah. to get smaller. One of the interesting engine. things that came out of that, I actually had two of those engines, and one of them had a was nine to one compression, and it had a, a dome on it, and of course, the cylinder head is a glove fit over the top of the piston, so you know you spend more time indexing the spark plug than you like to. Right. So the second one I did, I did it with a flat piston in it because I didn't want to mess around with it. Okay. I didn't pay much attention to dyno. It dyno 2620, so that was right. more than enough. 2600 horsepower. Yeah, at 9800. These are unheard <laughs> of 90, numbers. 9800 RPM. Yeah, these are five crazy, miles. There, but crazy there's a numbers. Sidebar to that, I'll come to in a point here in a minute. But uh, I went back and was looking through the stuff, and that was kind of a hurry up engine. Well, it turns out it was 8.4 to 1 compression. So when we did the, the dome piston one, it was really reactive to timing. I mean, it's three or 400 horsepower with five degrees of timing. Wow. The little engine, or the low compression engine, took about five degrees less timing wow. because it had a better flame front, okay. not having to go across okay. a dome. All right. So I, I learned something. Compression yeah. is, is a meaningless number when you boost them because mm. you're going to artificially establish a compression so point anyway. Pressure. Uh, with, and with the turbo charger. you'll eventually yeah. end up pulling so much timing out of it that you, yeah. you know you you haven't gained anything anyway. Right, right. So that was so it really didn't care about compression, but no. it liked the fact that the chamber was yeah. smoother. Essentially, didn't have yeah. to did better burn so and was less responsive to timing. Yeah. Didn't, and the, the raw ratio on this one happens to be two point six six to one. <laughs> So okay. much for rod ratio. Yes. So, so just to th put that in perspective, explain, explain what that rod means. ratio is, is you divide the, the, the length of the rod by the stroke. And, you know, like I built a 302 a million years ago. Oh, that that street, mo that. A street motor that was a 302 small block Chevy with a six-inch rod and a three-inch stroke. It was a two-inch one, two-to-one rod length to stroke ratio. People went, oh, you can't do that. And we were going to put a supercharger on it. And you said, doesn't matter. Yeah. And it didn't. It didn't care. Thanks. It doesn't care. What was interesting came out of that. Uh, was the fact that 
How many times did we advance the timing before we got it in an auction? Oh, my goodness. We kept throwing timing started, at it. started at 20 and just, degrees and ended up at 32 or 34. Yeah, with a blower on it at 10, at 10 or 12 pounds of boost, a street motor, but, and, and it never rattled it, no, until, it, I mean, we eventually got there. But yeah, yeah, but, you know, if you, if you look at there's there's always interesting little things that come along sidebar wise, but that has to do with the piston acceleration, top dead mm -hmm. center, bottom dead center, back to top dead center. Sure. Right. And the thing about that little engine, let's say at 9,800, we shifted it to 10,000. Wow. So wow. if you take 10,000 repetitions of, its, of a cylinder or its displacement, mm -hmm. and then you take say six or 7,000 repetitions of a bigger engine, but add the numbers up, Oftentimes, the little engine is bigger than the big engine. So essentially, it's acting like a 550 cubic inch motor at 10,000, where the other one's running at yeah. 8,500, something know, like that. It's just the more RPMs you can turn efficiently, because if that's a 35 cubic inch cylinder at 10,000 RPMs, mm -hmm. that's a number. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it's a yeah. 50 cubic inch cylinder at 5,000, that's a number. Mm -hmm. but, and so. and, and the, the horsepower equation will tell you that the faster you can spin it, if you can make the torque up there, it's going to make horsepower. Yeah, friction right. And, uh, right. and weight and stuff. And, yeah. and obviously, uh, they don't make much torque. No. Ever. Right. Just so if wheel spin them. is your enemy and you're on traction control right. for three or four miles, you're just not on traction so, control. So it's hard. actually a benefit. So it actually works, works out better. And that was yeah. our, we were very fearful of the big engine. Uh -huh. if we, could we even control that thing? Because it was going to spin. Yeah. yeah. And uh, every engine in the car uses those 88 millimeter turbos. So they're part of the car. So they're part of the car. So yeah. whatever engine goes in, it just they get the big turbos. So. And, and that, that's something we should point out, too, that, that so much of Bonneville for the, for the ultimate class that you guys run in is all about aerodynamics. So really, really quickly, it's, it's frontal area times the drag coefficient gives you a drag area number. The smaller you can make that drag area number, the less of a, a hole you have to punch through the air. So, <clears throat> so yes, less right. horsepower. So the car is as small as possible when you look at it straight on from the front. So the it, packaging is everything in, oh, a, yeah. in a streamliner. And you guys have fitted everyone from, a, from this tiny little motor to a 557 big block in the same envelope. And, yeah. and I, I've looked at this car, and with the little motor, the packaging is astonishing. And with well, a big yeah, motor, the, it had to be just amazing. You know, the mindset was I started with an 8-inch, eight 8 200 deck small block because I figured that would fit. Mm -hmm. And then when I got tired of working on 8 200 deck small blocks, uh, <laughs> went to the regular 9-inch deck. And it still fit. Yeah. That's not bad. So I built the LS. The, the LS engine was actually about the same overall width as at nine. What was that? That was a nine three forty deck or something. I think on mm -hmm. that one. So, but anyway. But then, I called my buddy at Noon and Racing, Daryl Makins. Says Daryl, how wide is the Hemi? Because I, I really wanted one of those Hemi's bad. <laughs> a, a Gen three Hemi. Yeah. The, 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 the current billet, the billet drag race Hemi. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, top okay. fuel, or not top fuel, but the alcohol funny car. Yeah. Okay, so the yeah. Gen 2. Yeah, Gen yeah. 2. Yeah. yeah. It has about a foot wider than the frame. So, <laughs> so that was the end of that story. So yeah, still runs this wide, yeah. There's I was building problem. an engine for a guy at a 555 uh, inch deal, and mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't put it all together. I had a bunch of parts laying around there. So we took the cylinder heads and a 454 block and set it in the car and then moved it back an inch and three quarters, I believe it was. Actually, what we did, we took, there's a tab for the motor plate, and we just jumped on the back side of the tab and put a spacer in it for the rear motor plate pickup point. Amazing. And so, it fit. So, so, so just to put this in perspective, you've got five or six different engine combinations that you've got. So small yeah. through, small block through Chevy, F. LS, and then big block Chevy. Mm -hmm. And they all fit, and each one is packaged like a... Um, Works in a drawer mentality yeah. where you, you literally you package it and it bolts right in. So everything bolts back up yeah, again, which is astonishing. Self-contained engine package. They have their own right. oil tank. Their own, everything's there. Even the wiring harness is there for the quick connects. There so you, you go. Just basically plug it in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. Question, which question is, I have is, is weight-wise. I mean, obviously, these different power, power plants weigh very different amounts. So when you're you know, balancing out the vehicle, are you having to do some kind of ballast change? or kind of on that, but what we did, we got smart and did some... They got Chuck Jenks involved, did some aerodynamic studies on it. Yeah. it. Turns out there wasn't much to improve on, but we got rid of the scoop on the top. But I was, I complained about that scoop forever because when you looked over the top of the cowl, what did you see is the scoop above it. Uh -huh. So 
luckily George had blown up a couple of big turbos, and we had a really good smoke screen. You could, you know, he's crewing down there about 400 miles so an hour. You see with, the airflow with smoke with coming the, out the exhaust, the explosion now. and it's about that it. far up the vertical stabilizer. So it's separating. Separating. So when Chuck said, "Well, first thing I do is ditch the scoop," I says, "Thank you, Chuck." Yeah. So when we went to the wind tunnel, without the scoop on it. It dropped the smoke six inches on the on the vertical wow. stabilizer. Wow, so that's a lot. Every, that's huge. A that, yeah. big deal. And yeah. uh, to give a, to give a shout out to Chuck Jenks, he's, he's another old friend who who uh, was an aerodynamicist for an F one team for a while, yeah. and is now working on an IndyCar team, I believe. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's the aerodynamicist on the Speed Demon yep. now, the, 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 the new car. Oh yeah, yeah, we got we got we got some good engineers involved in this. Thing yes, now. yes. So, Which. So, yeah. I'm sorry. Go, no, ahead. No, go, ahead, go ahead. So how are you putting the power down for a guy who doesn't know the inside workings of this deal? So you've got the power, you've got this potentially now 3,600 uh, foot or horsepower. What is, what is it transfer? How is it working its way back to the, to the, to the is, ground? Uh, since George has one method of driving, and that's slam the throttle to the floor when he leaves the push truck and lets off when he clears the last bag down. Nice, nice. So uh, we just have we heavily laden on traction control. And that traction control up to this point in time has been timing, obviously. And then we ramp the boost in based on the position on the course. So, for example... Uh, so it's constantly shifting is what you're yeah, saying. There's if, a, if lot the, of, a lot of telemetry going on with this. Most here. years we'd see wheels spin to maybe 400 or something like that. So oh, good. 400, using, 400, oh, 400 oh, miles per hour, the tires. the tires are still spinning. What we do is <laughs> when it got to the point of entering the last mile, we basically turned the traction control upside down where it got dumb, didn't do anything, mm-hmm. because we needed that seven or eight or nine seconds wow. at full power, not at 10 or 12 degrees. Yeah. So if you look at the average power, it probably the average power is a stretch, I think, is 2,000, you know, for the whole run. Uh-huh. Really? Okay. Because you start off at 15 pounds, you go to 20, 25, 30, right. and, uh, and yeah. every once in a while, it'll be all the way back to top dead center on, on the timing to try to get the wheel to catch. But yeah. Okay. This last year, we had some pretty darn hard salt, and at two and a half miles, we were off traction control. Wow. Wow. And we wow. just, we really didn't take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. And the big block was, was going to be a pretty good deal there because uh, we figured, well, we get it four, three or four miles down, we, we were turning up the wick on it. Mm-hmm. Well, the first three or four runs, the boost control wasn't working properly because one of the uh, solenoids that f- fed the reference pressure was bleeding off it had a diaphragm oh, was broken uh, in or something okay. so uh, when we a finally dime, a dime part right? yeah when we, when we finally figured it out we just instead of trying to control the pressure to it we just right. hooked it up to the shift line that mm-hmm. went to the transmission 110 pounds and nice and let it work and uh-huh. of course then we went from running 450 to 480 <laughs> so <laughs> had we, up 30 miles an hour yeah wow. had we done that a day or two earlier we would have taken advantage of the fact that we were hooked up earlier in the run and could have put more power to yeah. it. So yeah. it literally could have pe- picked up another wow. 10, 15 miles. So you mentioned something that's worth talking about is essentially this comes down to average acceleration. The, the yeah. faster you can average accelerate it, mm-hmm. the faster you're going to go. But generally what happens is at the five mile point, most cars are tapped out, yeah, right? So their the entry last speed. Mile at the same speed they exit the last at mile. Exit. This car doesn't do that. No. Luckily <laughs> this it doesn't. car does not do that. So what entry speed was? Well, let, let's use true mile. Point, okay. Uh, because the, the way bon, they do at Bonneville, actually the, the last mile is, is, is not a last mile. It's, they start the clock early. And, early. and, and, and close and, it early? Well, they close it off at the very end. But, okay. they, but to try to get between 132 feet, they have to start earlier or something. Right. Anyway, um, on the GPS, uh, it was running 454 miles an hour as it entered the last mile and went out at 481. One. So it was, it, it picked up 30 miles an hour in the final mile. Yeah. And, and most cars are tapped out completely by that time. And, and to add insult or injury, the shift lights quit working and he had to shift it on the rev limiter. <laughs> so 15 seconds of the 59 second run was on the rev limiter. Wow. Terms of coming up the deal, it's like it's there's a lag, is there not between when the, when well, the light it, comes on and, and you mean it, the peak is, has been reached? What happened? Well, we went to a soft rev limiter, which didn't help. Mostly George was always really good it. at catching the rev limiter because we used to have him shift. If we were going to go for a, a record run of like the little, little motors uh-huh. on, the, on the return pass, I would just have him shift on the rev limiter in the last two or three years and you know, when it hit the limiter shift because I didn't want to have to go in and reprogram the shift light. Uh-huh. So this one, we've been shifting at 8,000, and uh, went, went four, 
79. This run, it went 481, shifting at 8,800, and on the rev limiter at the same time. Oh, boy. Wow. But the soft limiter, I don't think, stops the car, you know, just abruptly stops you like it would if, so it's if hard it was that feel. real hard bang, 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 bang thing. Yeah, yeah. It just kind of goes up and flattens out, and mm -hmm. then he, boom, the next year. <laughs> he knows. Keep on going. <laughs> and he didn't know how fast he went. Wow. He, he figured that was a... Just a kind an of average run. Average run. Yeah. So then we were talking earlier a couple of days ago, and you said if after this after this next event, you may stay an extra day and lengthen the track. We, there's some talk about yeah, getting another half a mile, and okay. that way we can. It won't be a record of any kind. It'll just be a personal mm -hmm. thing. You know, we can average 500. Yes. And yes. since it's accelerating that hard, we've got a taller gear. We, that was a 164 final. I think we got a 154 wow. final. Which <laughs> what, what is the record for a wheel driven? It, that's it. That's it. it. Is. That is right yeah. now. Which Wheel is driven, piston which driven. Is by a four, bunch. 480? It's Where actually the average is 470. 470. 470. Yeah. Okay. Four, uh, the exit speed was 481, 576, the and the, uh, the actual average is 470.015. So it's kind of interesting because in the morning out there when it's dark and we're getting ready to go, George Moore says, uh, well, how, how fast are we going to go? I said, well, you should have, I think our average was like, 469 says you'll have a 470 average and a 480 exit and i'd be damned if we didn't do it <laughs> and money, a 481 and uh, good guess but you know yeah. you, you get enough guys that understand what we're doing there's we've got three or four guys in that group that can kind of think like a drag racer mm -hmm. you know in drag racing you know you talk to these guys they say well we're gonna go out there and run a such and such number and they usually do it mm -hmm. and everybody says, how do they do that well it's not how they did it it's they looked at the data for about four hours yes. and figured out how you could do it. Yes. And, uh, and we're data hauled the pants, thing. I mean, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. he's got a feel. He knows when he's at a certain rate, yeah. you know. Yeah. Is All right, we'd like to thank our advertiser, Alden American. They've uh, been around for 40 years doing coilover shock conversions for muscle cars, and they do, uh, they do a pretty good job, Steve. They do an awesome job, and interesting enough, first time I came to California, I met Frank Aldana, who's the guy who created the Alden shock and a kind of a staple in the drag racing community. So I know they've been doing amazing stuff for a very long time. Yeah, it's really good stuff. Um, they make shock absorbers, coilovers, and suspension kits for thousands of applications. Uh, you pick out your specific year and model, and they probably have a system for it. They design and test them in the USA. It's all American-made, racing street performance and vehicle-specific applications across the board. Uh, and also, they uh, hang their hat on the fact that they're bolt and go. There aren't a lot of modifications that have to happen. You buy them, you put them on, you go down the road. So, so check them out at All in American and uh, see what they've got. The website? Yeah. AllInAmerican.com? AllInAmerican.com. That too. And you can use promo code CARGUY10 to get 10% off your order at AllInAmerican.com. And with ARP, it's not just a lot of intake manifolds, uh, studs for heads, right. but they also have a humongous selection of American and metric that we use all throughout the car, even large bolts that we use on the suspension components because you want that same strength, that same durability and reliability Plus the beautiful looks. And the and, stuff outside the catalog. Right. They have a special order program where if you're if you're a builder and you need some special stuff made, they can do that for you. So it's an amazing, amazing company to work with. So check them out at arp-bolts.com or check out their catalog. You'll find everything you're looking for. I was watching some of the videos, and, and uh, for those of you who have never been to Bonneville, Bonneville is like racing on the moon. It's, it's a thin veneer of, of salt, and salt is not a very good traction device. It's, no, not, it's not like asphalt or concrete. So, to, you know, when you we, we talk rust. about spinning <laughs> the tires, he, you know, three-fourths the way down the track, he spin the tires, because I was watching some of the videos, and the rooster tails are, it's hard to judge what it is. We judge the speed by the rooster tail, incidentally, in the push truck. Yeah. Okay, really? Nice. Okay. Yeah, when, that, when it starts throwing the salt really, really high, uh -huh. that means it's on a good run. Yeah. Nice. And Because uh, he's going over the horizon when about, about the time the salt really starts to go up in the back. It's typically when he kind of goes out of sight at our, our, at our eye level in the pickup, you know. So then we have to wait for the guys to come on the PA and tell us what they're doing. But so, and also, put this in perspective, 400 miles an hour is four football fields a second, I think. Because mm -hmm. 200 is two football fields. That's so crazy. 400 will be four. And he's going 480. Yeah. So he's probably well, going closer that, to six that, football fields a second. That last mile takes 7.4 seconds. Wow. <laughs>
Just insane. So, so you guys, insane speeds, yeah, yeah, I mean, and it, and it wasn't but a few years ago. I mean, 25, 30 years ago, the record had kind of stagnated, I think, at 404. The speed of motive car had it at a little over 400 miles an hour. Yeah, there was some stuff back then. And yeah, single engine blown Chrysler Hemis and stuff like that. And it was yeah. very, very stagnant. Twin, twin engine stuff, yeah. Yeah, and then I think, I think what happened was the technology showed up at, at Bonneville, really. Mm -hmm. And because, again, for those of you who may not know, there's no, there's no cheering crowds there's no, there's no money. There's no sponsorships. There's nope. no, there's no TV rights. They're going to pay you a million dollars to go to set a new land speed record in an engine driven. None of that. This is all just for the sake of racing. It's just something to do. Yeah, and and, and <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, which is an, enormously and, cost. Yeah. You know, it's costly. The interesting antidote to that is uh, one year. Um, uh, ESPN, I believe, was had a, a film crew up there and had a, a young girl that was going to do the thing. They, her torture was to send her to Bonneville and film these guys out there. Okay. So, so we had grenaded an engine, one of them small blocks, shot a rod through the side of the block. And so it's sitting out there on the salt about halfway down the course. And this was one of those uh, uh, FIA deals so we could sit on the course. Oh, okay. So George and I are standing there talking and laughing about it. And she comes up. She says, uh, well, you don't seem very upset. George says, oh, we've got another one in the trailer. So then she says, well, how do you know when you're done? I says, on Friday, if we've cleaned the trailer out, we're going home. We have nothing left to play with. And it was <laughs> absolutely true. Friday, we went home because we had used up all of our engines. And broken all the motors. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's not a spectator sport out there. You know, no. you, you can wait a long time between runs. Yes. I mean, there's a situation where sometimes they come a little faster. But uh, Tom, do you know Tom Center? Did you know Tom Center? Tom Center was a crazy Bonneville guy. He was my, my editor at Popular Hot Riding way back when. And he literally would, he had audio from Bonneville. Mm -hmm. And he would just sit there and get all tingly as the things went by. He just, that was his, that was his, uh, you know, his uh, serious radio was, uh, you know, the sounds of Bonneville. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it was pretty amazing because, because he had all the speakers set up and you just kind of, but that was way more fun than actually going there. If you didn't, <laughs> if you weren't with a team, if you weren't with a team that was doing something exciting, like what you're talking about, mm -hmm. if you're just up there waiting for a car to go by, it's, it's not, not great. Let's talk a little bit about that. How many guys on the crew? Uh, I'd say a t a f yeah, probably officially 10 or 12. 10 or 12. And then and these are all volunteers. Nobody's getting paid. No, 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 yeah. no. One thing about this deal, if, if, if you show up as a member of the crew, but uh -huh. you get work someplace else, mm -hmm. you get paid. George pays wages okay. to be there. Okay. Excellent. Well, that's very cool. And, you know? and that about George as well. We have, a, we have a whole bunch of camp followers, we call them, you know, <laughs> they're guys that come and do a lot of work. I mean, they, yeah. Right, haul the trash off. They run to Salt Lake City and pick up parts. They just, right. you know, they cooking lunch for us and stuff right. like that. Because so, it's a big operation. Yeah, yeah and when at you, that point, you've got about twenty-five people involved. Yeah, and, somebody, uh, somebody with sunblock to put the sunblock on your neck. <laughs> Probably, yeah. And then you got because that's know, where yeah. you get burned. Unfortunately, yeah. the wreck uh, right, right off under the here. sun. Yeah, and the bottom get, of your earlobes. Yes, you get, <laughs> kind of, you kind get of figured smoked. out. You know, the first couple of years I went, uh, we tried to do an engine change, and it took all day. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know. We come back next year. We're just going to have these motor plate engines. So you pull one out and drop one in. Yeah. So then it's put a boom in the trailer so we can pick this thing up and don't have to use a cherry picker. You know, and then the, this kind of stuff is just evolving evolve. and evolve. Right, right. Well, tell you what, that guy there, his job is to do one thing. Mm -hmm. He's not multitasking. He's not in there trying to tighten up a fuel hose and, and back putting the wheels on. Uh -huh. So we, we've got it down to where we pretty, have, pretty well have guys that do their particular thing their area and they're, they're, and they're kind of responsible for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we used to, we had a deal where we thought it's going to be kind of nice. We'll have a checklist. We'll have these guys go back to the checklist. Well, first thing they do is they, the fuel fittings were tight. They put a wrench on it and tighten it some more, you know, which is a natural right. thing that you'd want to do. Right. Cause you have no idea how tight tight is. Mm -hmm. Right. So then we figured, well, maybe that wasn't the best thing either. So we had one guy that, that can go back and look at them and uh, mm -hmm. make sure you don't have a fuel line loose or an oil line or something like that. And, uh, but that really, really picked it up. One guy is packing the chutes and, and back half of the car. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I brought Shane Tecklenburg, Tecklenburg on, on board uh, because I needed somebody to deal with the MoTeC more than I did. Uh -huh. And so he's doing the data analysis and, and, and we discuss the changes and mutually agree to what 
change gets made to the car. Mm -hmm. And as it's gotten more complicated, I spend maybe after a run, I might, I might spend an hour, two hours just kind of searching Looking. through my packet. Uh -huh. He's over there on his packet. Yeah. And then we've got uh, guys like Danny Drynan from uh, Indy that's an engineer, mm -hmm. Chuck Jenks, these guys, and they're looking over your shoulder and looking at the same thing you're looking at, and yeah. then one of the guys said, well, wait, what's that right there? Yeah, what is that right there? Yeah. You know, I, well, we, can, we can tell so much about what's going on. It's just incredible. Yeah. you, you got an all-star team there. I mean, those are, those are folks that have done this a long, long time. They have broken a lot of parts, like you say, and they know exactly what they're looking at. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good deal to have that kind of backup on a, on a situation like that. These are, these are iconic Hall of Fame names from engine building in general. And, and you're on that list. I'll put you on that list. So, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we actually see some stuff that's kind of interesting. You know, we have a uh, power distribution module that runs the intercooler water, the intercooler pumps that pump that. They run the fans on the transmission cooler and the engine, uh, the drive, the rear different differential cooler. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of going through there, and I was telling this guy, I says, yeah, I says, you know, you, we just go look at the, the amperage draw on these components, and that'll tell you if it's working or not. And I says, for example, well, the one I picked for, for an example, one of the intercooler pumps wasn't working. Ooh, wow. So there's no amperage draw on the one pump. The other pump was drawing eight amps. All it was was when they pushed the DTM connector together, they didn't snap it. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? And you can't see it. You can't see it. Yeah. Visually, visually yeah, it looks it's okay. Where it was located. Yeah. So because it's it didn't a, click, it, yes. it's touchy it feel. didn't make the connection. Didn't make the connection. Wow. Made the connection, and then it's so drawn eight amps. So you didn't have an intercooler. Uh, well, one pump. Uh, we didn't have one pump, one but pump. we could have gone yeah. the full time. Not knowing that. Not knowing that. Yeah. And then yeah. we had a, a situation uh, a couple of years ago where... Uh, we only got a couple of runs with the big block and a couple of that little engine. But the little engine dynoed really nicely. I mean, it, it didn't have any problem trying to spool those 88s. It didn't start spooling them with about 9,000, mm -hmm. but it did it. So, uh, boy, it's surging like crazy. I mean, the manifold pressure is all over the map. The engine, the turbo speeds are all over the place. So, all of those that say, well, it's because you're at Bonneville. Uh -huh. I'm not buying it. Yeah. It took me about four or five days. I'd walk by the dyno cell, and I'd have that program, the data log up, and I'd walk by and look at it. And then I got to look at it. Well, wait a minute. Why is it running 70,000 RPMs, then it's running 90,000 RPMs, then it's running 60,000 RPMs? So we went down and plugged the laptop into the car to test the two solenoids that, that actuate the air over for the waste. Well, one of them was stuck open. Oh. putting 80 pounds of air pressure on the top of the dome, wow. blowing the wastegate Whoa. shut on, on the right side, and the left side is over there trying to bake 20 pounds of boost. Yeah, yeah, so it's not and happy at all. If it hadn't have been for well, the fact, <laughs> if we hadn't had shaft speed, <laughs> we would have gone, that. We yeah. gone back to the following year with the same problem. Yep. 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 And, uh, Which just points out, really, if you think back to the 70s, when no one had that kind of information, drag racing or, or Bonneville, how, how amazingly fast they went with no data at all, you know, well, except an ET and a speed. That was it. No 60-foot times, no inter intermediate times, oh, yeah, well, no 1,000-foot times, no nothing, just an ET and a speed, and you had to, and you had to consider all those variables. I mean, yeah. you went through that. You did all oh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why, told that's me why that I really was... like data logging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, because now you don't have to guess anymore. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. yeah question yeah. this is something that you know it's a little change of things i mean as i mentioned earlier like you're the you were the king of and still are obviously king of, of turbo buicks turbo you know v6 technology how did you get into that as as a start i mean people you know those those engines showed up i mean in the early 80s i guess they were and right then, place the right time I, and i'm <laughs> just gonna say so how did you get drawn into that well, you have customer that come in or no, you know what uh, i had a, a small flow bench and you know, grind on heads in the evenings and stuff. And John Foley come driving down the driveway one day. And John was, he was appointed by Buick to promote V6 race stuff. He was in Turo, right? Yeah, he lived yeah, in yeah, Turo at the yeah. time. He says, I hear you have a flow bench. I said, yeah. He says, you want to check these things out? He had me a couple of stage two iron heads that they'd just come out with, NASCAR oh, stuff. Brand yeah. new stuff. Well, boy, those were really good. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, started hacking and grinding on those. And then he, found enough money in his budget to buy a, a super flow bench, one of the new ones. Mm -hmm. So we had that, and then the next thing, you know, he's introduced me to all the people. He, he introduced me to everybody, I mean, and if, because he knew 
all the players. Yeah. And John was he, – he didn't really like to be put in that position. I think he, it made him ner- more nervous than he appeared. Mm-hmm. So, it's, hey, kid, you go talk to that guy about sponsorship. You go do this. You go do that. Uh-huh. And so, uh, like I say, literally I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I got involved with Buick Special Products, and then that in turn – allowed me to source their parts. And I remember uh, thinking that, you know, gee, it'd be nice to, if we could just turbocharge the stage two motors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought, well, I can. All I got to do is call them. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. so and what, that's like 84, 85, or even earlier? It started in 84. 84, yeah, all right. And along the way, uh, John come by one day, he says, uh, I'd like to take Margie's car to the Winter Nationals and run the stock class. <laughs> I said, well, you do know. Marge, that, Margie's that, over here, Mar- by the way. <laughs> Margie's Ken's that, wife, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Her 84 Buick, yeah. turbo Buick. Perfect. And so, run at the Winter Nationals. So uh, I said, John, you, do, you know that those cars are not stock. Yeah. You weren't aware of that. I said, no. I said, you, couldn't, you don't take a stock car and run it. Okay. You get a stock you body stock thing eliminator? and you build okay. a stock eliminator yeah. car. Right, yeah. right. No. So we go back to... GM back there, and they gave us, uh, it was actually a pre-production car, and gave us two pre-production cars. It turns out the one that they, got, they were going to give me. These are, are these Regals? Regals, yeah. yeah okay. Turbo right. Regals. Sure. Well, right. the, the, the one Turbo Regal they were going to give me was an 83 with the pillow interior and all. I mean, ugly. <laughs> and then Perfect. They, couldn't, they couldn't find it, so they said, well, would you be okay with that styling exercise car that they had there? And they, well, basically, they put a fiberglass nose on it. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, when the car showed up in Ventura at John's shop, both cars were there. Well, John was out of town, and I knew what was going to happen, so I, I brought both of them out to the shop. <laughs> I pulled the engine out of both of them. Yeah, pull them apart. Yeah. And drug the red one, the, the styling exercise went over and put it in the bay, and that, that's got to be the one we're going to go to the races with. <laughs> and, and then he gave the, the other one to somebody to, to do something with it. Uh-huh. Uh, that was kind of how it all got started, got you know. Started. And then and I, I just ran across this little detail when I was doing another story that it was Buick's development of their IndyCar engine cylinder heads that led to the small block Chevys starting to change the valve angles. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah. yeah. In fact, Dart actually made what they called the, uh, the Buick V8 head. Mm-hmm. The Buick V8 head for NASCAR, and then NASCAR didn't allow it. No, they didn't and, allow it. And, and then just the as well they didn't because it, it, right. it wasn't, <laughs> right, the structural right. integrity wasn't there. <laughs> right. So, no. But the drag but racers used mask and use it in drag racing, yes. and that started that whole 11 degree. Then, then we got into the, yeah, and then the symmetrical port heads and mm-hmm. stuff like that because the right. one thing the Buick had going for it, the, the guy that pinned that head was pretty brilliant. I mean, in 1983 when he designed that head, it outflowed anything anybody had at that time. Yep. Yep. Nice. And uh, it didn't. It, it didn't necessarily get a lot better because of the bore centers and stuff. Right. That, that the first iteration was probably just about as good as they got. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was right up until uh, NASCAR pulled the plug on the V6s in the. Yeah. The, yeah. Was, what year was, that? was it in the nineties? Was that later? Somewhere in there, huh? Around 1990, yeah. Something yeah, like yeah. That. yeah, they, they got right. tired of them breaking crankshafts right. all the time. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Most of them couldn't go 250 miles. So right, there right. You know, so right. Well, I, got, I got a question for you. Is of, um, you know, this is car guy confessions here. So is there anything you want to confess about things that you built over the years that maybe weren't quite what they were supposed to be or something that uh, was pretty fun? I was just throwing that out there. Is there anything? A bunch of them that weren't what they were supposed to be. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> anything you want to uh, reveal here on uh, Car Guy Confessions? Any Gosh, fun? I'd have to think about that one. But, okay. Well, you know, we've had some, some turkeys. I mean, like yeah. everything else, you know, you, uh, or as my buddy Ed Taylor would say, suffering from improvement. Suffering from improvement, uh, yes. Or yes. one day we're dyno on an engine, and uh, some guy walked up and was looking in the door there, and Ed says, Man, I said, I don't know what's wrong. He said, that thing's down, about four, down to about 1,400 horsepower. And the guy says, well, what was it before it went down to 1,400? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, you're down to 1,400. So we're lamenting about what we've accomplished there, you sure. know, which is nothing. Because right, it's not right, making any power. Right. That's pretty funny. And uh, but it was, it was one of those little things that kind of sticks in your head because it's a naive person Doesn't looking through the game. door. Yeah. 
amazed at what he's seeing and thinking 1,400 is a lot yeah. of horsepower. Because some people equate, you know, really palatial shops and polished floors and all this stuff with, with big horsepower, NASCAR, maybe whatever those kinds of things are. And then, and then you know, you have other shops where it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's the stuff that comes out of the shop. Is, shop. It's, yeah. Yes, it's a working shop. And so, you know, your shop is very unassuming. It's in the back of a little alleyway. But yet the horsepower numbers that come out of there, well, like Bonneville Speed Records. Bonneville Speed Records. Out of a little shop in, in Santa Coy. So to it dabble, has to be very satisfying. Yeah. You know, dabble with ProMod, you know, and yeah. build yeah. A, a wedge instead of a Hemi. Everybody's running Hemis. So yeah. sure. the customer didn't want a Hemi, he wanted a wedge. We built a wedge. Yeah. Thing was wicked fast. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's just. <laughs> you had, one of the times I was there, there was, I, I want to say it was a big block, but it was built for some Middle Eastern guy who had a boat. And he had a pair of these motors. Then they were counter rotating. One went that one way, and the other went the other way. What in Arizona? Yeah. It's a, oh, Arizona. Yeah. Middle East, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, a little bit. A lot of sand. sand. A lot of that's sand right. Sand. It was sand. a little bit east of where we're at. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, it is for us. But uh, but I just I mean there was there were there was like some purple stuff on them and there was like a lot of bunch of anodized. Purple. He liked purple. Anodized right? purple valve covers and purple oil pan and. But it was I mean that was those were awesome motors. Yeah. I mean, those, about twenty two hundred each and. Not bad, huh? In a boat. A pair of them. Yeah. Pair pair of them. In a and 40 counter, counter foot, rotating foot boat. Because the because the different yeah. props and such. So Yeah, so they I mean, offset the torque that way. Yes. Otherwise yeah. it wants to go that way. Which <laughs> is good if they're <laughs> a circle an track. Endeavor. And then then I did have uh, some guys in um, Dubai that wanted the, the, they got really fascinated with the V sixes over there. We I shipped some stage two Buick V sixes to them and they, they've got this hill climb that's in January of the year, and it's a, it's more almost more than a hill climb. They have the cron deck clocks on it, the whole thing, you know. The hill climb that they do. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, I've heard of well, that. The first yes. couple three years, the Buick V6 has dominated. The first year, it won overall. Wow. Really. And you got to keep in mind they have a spec tire. Yeah. Okay. So having a gazillion horsepower doesn't necessarily doesn't guarantee really, you're going really to win. You. Right. Exactly. We're back so, to the tire spin again. So <laughs> these guys said uh, they called. And they said uh, we want a couple of billet V6s. So I'm saying, okay, and I'm thinking about it. I said, well, small block, big block, whatever. Oh, Kenny, whatever you want. So five three bore centers. <laughs> you know, no, five five inch bore centers. The five, five three five. the five three bore center was Alan Johnson's one for the, the Prince that had the Alan Abbey racing thing. But uh, so these were that, that's five point five inches between the centers of the bores. Yeah. Yeah. That's this is a big V six. So they anyway, <laughs> all billet, pretty cool. Nice. Uh, Made 3,000 horsepower, real easy. Ugh. Odd fire V6. Odd fire. Wow. Oh, yeah, common crank pin. Oh, man. Yeah. And, uh, that, that, so does it shake For the books, bit? that's odd Not fire. Really? Really? No, really? It's, yeah. it's probably, the shake is probably more associated with low RPM stuff, you know, when you're buzzing you less, up. less time between, fi- or more yeah. time between firing pulses, so well, it allows yeah, it to move. Yeah, you're 60 degrees out of phase. The right bank right. is 60 degrees behind the left bank. Right, so it's right. It's kind of weird, but... Uh, but these things were pretty cool. I mean, all billet, wow. really pretty wow. engines. And uh, Mike Magda, I think, did an article on them. Mm-hmm. And I took no pictures. I had no, nobody taking professional pictures of these engines because these guys, you know, that's secret, secret yeah, stuff. Yeah, they don't want anybody to know what they're doing. And right. uh, I started digging through, and I found enough pictures for Mike to do the story in the <laughs> RET. Wow. How nice. And, yeah. and then yeah. I was looking at the pictures, and then I and I'd accidentally stuffed in one of them. 350 inch billet V6 small block. Oh boy. But nobody would have caught it. Right. I, right. I didn't catch it on right. the first couple of go arounds. But those Surprise. were interesting things. Surprise. Yeah. Wow. So a, little, a, lot, of, a lot of different types of things. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's got yeah. Uh, diversity yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I love those Buick V6s. I remember we test drove them for the magazines and they were awesome. Interesting at the time frame they, they arrived on the scene, they and, were and they put turbochargers on the map, really. It was absolutely. a combination, it was a good timing of, of electronic fuel injection, turbochargers that were halfway yeah. decently sized and everything else. And now turbochargers of the whole world. I remember when they went to the, the, the 3800 with the with the roots blower on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. one, one of the guys back at GM, one of the official officials, said, We'll never turbocharge anything again. <laughs> 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 That didn't hold long, did it? <laughs> no, no, it didn't. It no, didn't. just it's, wait around. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, there's some. You're, you're going back to Vonneville this year. Yeah, yes. the Speed Demon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and, you, and you said you said you're going to put somebody else in the car. 
Because is George going to yeah, drive we again got a, this we got year? Yeah, different driver. We'll let him brag about it. But, okay. Uh, he's directly involved with the team. Okay. And, uh, okay. Cool. The uh, and his engine. We I t- I pulled the panel on it the other day and checked it. We had a you know data is data, mm-hmm. but it's not always correct data. Okay. So we put this little engine in, and George making a pass, and he, and he shut it off and turned out about two miles down the course. And we didn't know what was wrong. We went up there, and he says, uh, oil pressure light came on. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, got back to the pits and was looking at the data. Well, it said it had 160 or 70 pounds of oil pressure, and it said that the fuel pressure was 170 pounds. Well, I immediately knew that that can't work because the, the injector shut off at 140. Uh-huh. I mean, they simply will not just don't have the electrical power to open up against that kind of pressure yeah so it was running Mm -hmm. so uh probably had a sensor ground that that affected that Uh and uh so just for the heck of it we pulled the panel up the other day and and it looked as though it had never been ran so it was it was strictly uh misinformation sensor sensor failure yeah Yeah, Yeah. so that one's good to go and yeah uh, and this is the little motor the 299 no 255 250 okay okay you missed that. 255. <laughs> 255, 56, 57, whatever. <laughs> right, there right, you go. Right. Absolutely. It's one of the little It, it can right. only go 260, 260 cubic inches, I think, or okay. 261. And that's the limit for the class. Yeah. That's so this limit. is the motor we talk about where the piston doesn't really move up and down. It just vibrates? It wobbles. <laughs> it wobbles. <laughs> and, you know, and how hard are you going to spin that one? 9,000? No, no, no. We shifted at 10. 10. Yikes. We, had to, we actually had the shift light come on at, at 10,050 yeah. because we wanted, kind of wanted to be over 10. Over 10? That's, <laughs> that's like the spinal tap because you can go to 11. That's so right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it'll, it'll run to 11,000. <laughs> and and it amazing. literally starts running at 8,500. Wow. Uh, it makes little or no boost. It made four or five pounds at 5,000, three pounds at 5,000. Because you still have the big turbos on the, the car because on it, they yeah. stay on the car. And when we went to yeah. the Gen 2 88, wow. the new improved version. It they come more in air. That's crazy. It makes yeah. less boost early, but more boost later. But, right, uh, right. The uh, interesting thing is that we never went over 52 pounds. Wow. And, and literally 70 to 75 pounds, because if you look at the, look at the area you're putting the air into and the escape velocity, mm-hmm. that small an engine is always going to have way more manifold pressure observed than it than, than right. is until you maybe get to 70 or 80 pounds, and at that point you're getting the full benefit of the turbos. Wow. But... We can't go there because obviously it, you know, it'd be a hand grenade at that point. Right, right. Well, awesome. Amazing. Hey, well, you're going to go back in September? That when the next yes. round? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, yeah. well, we'll be watching. Yeah, exactly. This is great news. This, hey. is, this is fantastic yes. stuff. Well, Absolutely. Thank you for coming, man. Absolutely. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Fun. Talking always, tech, you know. Some yeah. of the stuff has been kind of That's featured. Right. I feel really at home now. We've I been know. talking tech for an I, hour. I, I, this is well, great. Same thing, same thing we talk about when you come by the shop. Exactly. You know, you're there for it's 10 no minutes. It's no different. Two hours later, you leave. Yeah. I'm going to wipe up underneath Jeff because Jeff has been sweating. His, uh, you know, the, the, the goosebumps have uh, yeah. worn themselves well, out. Just, They've uh, just, completely. You know, it's just it's just astonishing power levels. And after a while, it just it becomes another day at the office. It's the norm, you know? yeah. I mean, yeah. But uh, for those of us on the inside that struggle to make 600 horsepower, you know, the, the concept of making 3,000 horsepower is just amazing. Crazy. So, crazy. so crazy. I hope you get as much out of this as I did. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. And, it's been my um, pleasure. Awesome. And, Enjoyed and it. We might have to have you back again because there's all kinds of things we can talk about. So, yeah. If, yeah, service. exactly. So, uh, so uh, well, yeah. thank you, Kenny. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next time.